One, I think the attendees have slowed down uh, on joining. Welcome everyone uh, to our 2023 uh, webinar series, our first of 12. Um, we're really excited that y'all will be able to, are able to make it today. And uh, today we have Jeff Larkin um, talking about a collaborative approach to dynamic forest blocks. Uh, going forward, uh, feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Um, going forward, we will have um, our webinars on the second Tuesday, typically the second Tuesday of every month, um, all the way through uh, December. Um, there's a link to, we'll paste the link to the webinar series page on our SFEC website. Um, and you'll have an opportunity there to see, I think there's one that's on a Thursday instead of a Tuesday. But either way, I'm Lane Mosier. I'm the program coordinator uh, for the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative. Um, see lots of familiar uh, names in the um, attendees. And so without any further ado, uh, we'll just kick it off uh, to Jeff. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Lane. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to speak with you all this morning. Uh, understanding most of you are in the Western Great Lakes, and uh, I'm sitting over here in, in the central Appalachians. Uh, in a different forest type for the most part, but I think uh, I think I can share a lot of insights and successes that we've had in um, diversifying our forest structure, both for forest health and uh, of course um, forest uh, biodiversity. Um, so I'll start out with a little bit of kind of like setting the stage of kind of the conditions that we face here at forest managers and forest wildlife biologists face here in, in Pennsylvania and throughout much of the Appalachians, <clears throat> and then. We'll, um, we'll segue into uh, talking about dynamic forest blocks and the di dynamic forest partnership and the successes we've had and, and how we've been able to um, work collaboratively instead of competitively to, to achieve those successes. Um, oh, I should introduce that uh, myself first, that I'm a faculty at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. I have a master's in forestry, a PhD in, in wildlife um, for the last 12 years. I've worked with American Bird Conservancy pretty closely as a forest bird um, habitat advisor and as the science advisor for NRCS's Working Lands for Wildlife. You folks in your part of the world have, um, have the uh, RCPP. Uh, which is kind of a, a sister program to uh, to the work that Working Lands for Wildlife is doing for golden wing warbler and, and other forest birds here in the east. So again, my goal is to share the insight as to how an opportunity seeking uh, and diverse partnership. Um, I think those are two key components here is that we really work hard to be inclusive, to find opportunities, um, and, and we are welcoming uh, a diverse group of of conservation partners um, to help us uh, overcome the many constraints that that often frustrate working at large spatial extents um, to to have ecologically meaningful uh, impacts. Uh, eastern forests are are really diverse. Um, they're diverse in the the biodiversity um, that they that they have, both their flora, fauna, and, and other forms of of biodiversity and. For that, we benefit uh, in many ways, uh, whether it be ecosystem services, such as clean water and, and carbon sequestration and, and storage, whether it be recreation, whether you're a bird hunter or a, or a bird watcher, and of course, um, the, the rural economies that benefit from healthy uh, and diverse forests. And um, no different than your forests, we face our fair share of challenges uh, in the eastern forests of Pennsylvania and in the Appalachians, um, whether it be overabundant uh, or I should say uh, excessive browsing by deer, um, whether it be the, the forest pest of the day, gypsy moth, uh, wool, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, um, unsustainable timber harvests, uh, fragmentation and conversion and parcelization of our forests. Uh, all of those things threaten uh, biodiversity and, and the ecosystem services and, and recreational and, and economic opportunities that, that we have in our forests. One group of, um, of biodiversity that's been telling us that our eastern forests are um, in a little bit of a uh, trouble for, for some time now uh, are eastern forest birds. Um, we see the, the trends first 
uh, displayed in the state of the birds of 2009, where eastern forest birds uh, were declining and continue to decline. And then in the more recent 2019 uh, science article that basically chronicled the decline of 3 billion birds, uh, and of course, eastern forest birds representing a, a pretty good percentage of those 3 billion birds lost over the last 50 years. Um, forest birds, uh, probably one of the most um, studied groups of wildlife um, since modern wildlife science has been uh, in existence. Um, folks enjoy studying birds. They're, they're important indicators. They're uh, timing and conspicuous behaviors of the, of the nesting and, and migration seasons dovetail nicely with conducting studies. Uh, so lots of lots of lots of work have been done, volumes of, of journals and books and such um, that have really investigated um, the ecology of, of forest birds. And from all of that literature, we can really kind of glean two really important aspects of forest bird ecology and, and henceforth conservation, and that is landscape context, right? What percentage uh, of the landscape has forest? Um, what is the forest type? Uh, what is the age class distribution within any given uh, patch of forest? And then, of course, the structural complexity, more of a site level kind of a perspective. Um, how how does it you know how does the understory look in any one place? Uh, what does the canopy look like in any one place? And and here uh, on the right side of the screen we have um, we we have images from forests and these images are are from forests that look differently but are the same and all of that equals basically niches right? All of those are places for different species, in this case of birds, um, to, to carry out um, their, their annual um, needs to meet their life requisites and so forth. So our problem uh, is that our, our forests in the east um, are, are quite simple. Um, we have a lot of them, a lot of forests, 17 million acres of forests in Pennsylvania, a pretty good amount of forest cover. But we have to remember that our forests, uh, the forests that forest birds and forest wildlife co-evolved with were quite diverse. Um, they weren't all, you know, dominated by huge, large trees. Um, it's kind of a the, the misconception, if you will. There were lots of disturbance events occurring on that landscape. And of course, the age of trees um, uh, contributed to uh, micro scale, if you will, um, disturbances and, of course, structural complexity as a result of that. But we had that one massive sweep of landscape scale clearing that occurred in the late 1800s, early 1900s that you know, in, in a relatively short amount of time uh, wiped away that structural complexity that we had on our landscapes. And again, we're, we're fortunate um, in, in Pennsylvania and other parts of the Appalachians to have had a lot of forests recover, again, 17 million acres, but it all recovered around at the same time. Um, and because of that, our, our forests are quite middle-aged. And here's kind of the, a typical age class distribution, if you will, of, uh, of a typical Eastern forest uh, landscape. And you can see here that we have too little on either ends of the successional um, uh, spectrum of what should be expected for an eastern uh, forest. Uh, we have a lot in the middle and, and too much, you know, don't take that as too much. I, I don't think any of us would argue that we could ever have too much forest. We just have too much of that middle compared to uh, a paucity at the, at the other ends uh, of the spectrum. And for that reason, um, a lot of the species for which we are seeing the most precipitous uh, declines, those that are most imperiled, are associated mostly with those bookends. We combine this uh, relatively homogeneous, even aged, maturing forest landscape with several other factors that affect the structural complexity and availability of, <clears throat> of quality forests. 
and it really kind of paints paints the bleak picture of what forest biodiversity in in any any anyone or any aspect uh, of of forests uh, is facing, whether it be unsustainable uh, diameter limit cut, high grading, call it what you will. We see much less uh, on the landscape in our part of the world, again in Pennsylvania, of regeneration harvests, sustainable regeneration harvests. We see, of course, plenty of those invasive species, invasive species of the day, <laughs> it, it, it seems. Um, and of course, the, the products of, of uh, excessive deer browsing, uh, such as uh, carpets of hastened fern on the, on the landscape. And you can see here uh, a deer exclusion fence and a timber harvest. And uh, you can see the one side that is uh, nicely regenerating. And of course, the other side that, um, that is essentially a, a, a failed uh, clear cut. They all reduce the structural complexity uh, even more. So we have homogeneous mature forests, and we have areas uh, within those mature forests that are uh, experiencing many challenges. And we're not uh, our our stewardship activities are not uh, are not meeting the needs of creating the niches that were once very uh, populated on the landscape. We also know as um, as biologists that uh, the days of thinking just about nest success uh, is is over or nest density uh, are over and that the technology that we have had available to us over the last uh, couple of decades uh, have allowed us to look into the the lives of birds after they leave the nest, an important part of their life history, an important part of, of their demographics. Um, we have an example here of some work that Cam Fist did in, in Pennsylvania in, um, in overstory removals and uh, in, in two parts of the state where he equipped golden wing warbler fledglings uh, with radio transmitters. And you can see this uh, fledgling here uh, born in this overstory removal with scattered resi residuals. You would call them, I think, leg legacy trees or green trees uh, in, in the Western Great Lakes. And you can see what this uh, bird does after it leaves this four-year-old uh, overstory and the nest from which it was it was hatched. It goes up through this shelter wood, a four-year-old shelter wood that was done at the same time that four-year-old overstory was conducted. And then it spends the remaining um, battery life of the transmitter uh, to about age 30 in a stem exclusion phase 25 or so year old um, overstory removal. You can see that this individual moved relatively uh, short distance over that 30 day period. And, um, and of course was alive uh, at the end of, of when we were monitoring. Um, this is a typical nest site location of a golden wing warbler. Um, this is forest, right? It's young forest, make no mistake about it. Um, this, this, this timber harvest did not fragment the forest, it diversified forest structure at a stand scale. And if I was sharing my volume, you'd hear all sorts of other young forest, young structure associated species. And then we'll advance to one of those individuals in that nest um, wearing a radio tag um, after it leaves the nest. And you can see it here with, with dad learning how to forage on leaf rollers. And if I again could share my volume, you would hear a much different forest bird community. You'd hear Eastern wood peewees, American red starts, and other uh, more closed canopy, older forest uh, bird species. And you would not see that rubus and herbaceous cover around where this fledgling uh, is located. It speaks to the importance of having these different age classes in close proximity to each other. Uh, we had another study on cerulean warblers, very similar study here in the Allegheny National Forest and some game lands. And again, we found that um, this, this canopy nesting um, bird that has an affinity for oak forests left the nest, worked along a clear cut down a forest, down a forest road, and then uh, eventually into a 25-year-old clear cut in another shelter wood 
and that's where it was when the transmitter failed. Um, using dynamic forest structure uh, in a way uh, that is um, that that varies over time. So it's it's di it's dynamic use of dynamic forests uh, as these fledglings age. So the important takeaway here, and other studies have have found similar results for other species, um, is that where a cerulean warbler or where a golden wing warbler places its nest is not often what it looks like. Uh, where it takes its fledglings and where its fledglings learn to forage, evade predator, and prepare for uh, for migrating to Central and South America. So really, you know, that kind of information ad advances our, our knowledge and our ability to be more informed in how we manage our forest landscapes when we are working on programs that are trying to recover uh, or stabilize the uh, declining populations like a golden wing warbler and a cerulean warbler. We can no longer just think about where the nest is placed. They have to be thinking about where the nest is placed and what's around that nest and manage that area in context uh, of its of each species needs. And that's going to vary for a golden wing warbler and for a cerulean warbler in scale. Having this inf this basic ecological information allows us to work with forest managers uh, in a way that is going to achieve more complete um, habitat requirements uh, for these species across uh, a local landscape. Remember, these things, when they leave the nest, they don't even have a tail, right? They're still molting. They're still trying to figure out how to fly. Their mobility is quite limited. So we have to be thinking about proximity of different age classes or different structural conditions that are in line with the movement capabilities of the species of interest. So this is where thinking about planning for mosaics uh, is so important. And again, it's just not golden wings and ceruleans. There's a lot of papers out there. Some of the first radio telemetry papers uh, produce papers on, on songbirds in Eastern US um, in post-fledging period would have been done on wood thrush, a little bit larger uh, than the two warbler species I just mentioned. As you can see their concluding remarks, you know, large tracts of mature forests and a mosaic of early and mid successional forest stands. Uh, Eastern whippoorwills, a, a nocturnal songster that is absent from much of our landscapes and older generations of people that, that um, you speak with talk about times in which this species was quite common in our landscapes. And again, whippoorwill uh, for, for, for conserving the species, consider harvest strategies that maintain the availability of regeneration, regenerating patches in close proximity of mature forests. And their same story uh, and the same concluding paragraph for so many different taxa uh, uh, that, that we find here in the Eastern, uh, Eastern forests. Um, it's, it's almost as if uh, the last sentence or the last paragraph uh, is like move from one paper uh, to another, where we talk about the importance of structural complexity, um, having that heterogeneity in both forest type, age, structural characteristics, all of that coming together to, to produce conditions that will support a more diverse eastern forest bird and wildlife community. So again, 17 million acres. We got a lot of forest, kind of like that uh, that um, poem, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, right? Water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. I think that many forest birds are saying the same thing. Uh, we've got a lot of forests, uh, but not a place to nest and and or raise our young. And it's not just uh, forest wildlife, forest birds, um, it's, it's forests in general. Uh, and foresters are concerned about this. Forest managers are concerned about structural complexity and, and unbalanced age class structure. And when we are provided uh, evidence of this, if you look in almost any of uh, our, our state of the forests or our forest action plans uh, that are created by state agencies, um, every 10 years. And we see uh, statements like this in these plans. 
lack of diversity in age classes and successional stages, changing overstory species compositions, threatens, uh, threats from biotic and abiotic vectors, as well as poor management practices reduce the health and resiliency of the forest and produce poorer habitat for native species. Forest wildlife biologists and foresters are largely on the same page. And when we look at other science available out there on what healthy forests are and what they encompass, we see similar uh, theme. Forests produce uh, or promote diversity of nutri uh, nutrient dynamics, cover types, and stand structures, then, and they create a range of habitat niches for endemic fauna. We're in the business of recovering species, maintaining diverse communities within our forests, and the only way we get that is when we have diverse niches. Luckily, we have foresters uh, on our team. Uh, and this is really important and something I must stress. Um, all too often, you know, kind of looking back at the history of forest management, I think that far too often um, foresters and wildlife biologists were in conflict, uh, certainly more than they were in collaboration. And uh, and I think it's pretty clear that that foresters and forest managers, land managers are going to be and are an important part of the solution in recovering and, and keeping some of our some of our most imperiled species on the landscape. Um, they know what to do. As long as we provide them with um, the toolbox and allow them to use the tools in the toolbox, don't limit what they can use, let them use their professional knowledge um, and provide them with the funds necessary to be able to do the work they need to do then and, and realize that in some cases, when we're talking about invasive species control and fixing the wrongs of unsustainable harvest, particularly on private lands, that this might be uh, a costly venture. But a costly venture that's worth it when we find ourselves in a stand, uh, a regenerating harvest that's polluted with oak or a stand that may never be harvested again, but it is more resilient uh, after prescribed fire and other activities, preparatory slash um, forest and improvement activities were performed within the stand. The next time spongy moth rolls through this landscape, we're hopeful that this white oak component in our overstory is maintained uh, into the next canopy. We know that uh, the challenges are, 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 pretty, are pretty great. Uh, and we know that inaction is not an option uh, for many forest wildlife species that we have been studying. Um, it's clear that forests will continue to grow old uh, at a rate that will far outpace the availability of, of structurally, structural diversity from an age class uh, perspective. Um, it's important to allow those some of that maturing forest to continue to mature. There's no doubt about it. Um, but a species like the cerulean warbler and the golden wing warbler, who uh, you see the population trends over the last 40 to 50 years, um, they don't have time for forests to become naturally disturbed on their own. There is going to be, and there will require for some period of time, active forest management across significant amounts of lands to maintain their populations. This is a fact. What has been happening has not been working for these species. So it's going to require stewardship across and thinking about, again, the spatial context of these species, uh, full reproductive cycles, right? When they're when they here from touchdown to takeoff. Uh, we know we need to be thinking about landscapes, local landscapes to slightly larger than local landscapes to be able to achieve the conservation successes that we that we desire for these species. Two things uh, are important. Right? Basically, there's there's two parts of the puzzle. There's you know keeping forest on the landscape. That's pretty important. Um, and then of course. In Pennsylvania, 17 million acres, we're largely holding steady there. 
We're not losing uh, much in the way of forests on an annual or 10 year cycle. Um, however, one thing that we all need to be better at is being good stewards of our forests. Um, and, and when we think about that 17 million acres falling across a gradient of probably around 11.5 million being privately owned, mostly family forest uh, owned, and then um, the remaining being federal and state lands and some corporate lands. We have to be better, we have to be better stewards uh, across these local landscapes. And better stewards might require some forest stand improvements, uh, activities that are a little bit unsightly at first, uh, but can have great outcomes. Um, and it could be commercial harvest or non-commercial harvest or non-commercial activities that, that promote regenerating stands. It could just be some forest stand uh, improvement activities such as prescribed fire, uh, shelter wood sequences. And it could be, you know, things that are a little bit unsightly at first, like this carpet of hay and fern. And uh, to, to the untrained eye, this looks like uh, walking in this forest. It's kind of like a, a, pr a pretty place, right? It's got this wonderfully green lush carpet, big trees over top. But to a forester, we know that this is a very, very un, <laughs> unstable system, uh, and certainly one that will be challenged should those canopy trees uh, die. It'll be challenged to be um, become a forest again with this car fern carpet. So a treatment like uh, an herbicide application uh, might, might be necessary and is often necessary, but the outcome can be great. Uh, that fern, this is real pictures from some of our places where fern is, um, is removed, uh, mass crop produced, and we have the growing space and the conditions necessary to, to put oak back on the forest floor. We must become better stewards and recognize that we need to become better stewards and find ways uh, to, to generate the funds necessary to complete um, the activities, the practices that are going to be required at scales uh, that will have a biological impact. For Eastern forests, this is our canvas. Uh, and we can think about the private lands and the public lands and strong partnerships. I mean, these are the three recipes, if you will, uh, of successful forest conservation in the Eastern US. Um, there's a trend between golden wing warblers and the loss of young forests on the landscape. We were very lucky uh, in the beginning to, to, to um, work as a collective to generate uh, a conservation plan for the golden wing warbler and then uh, associated forest management guidelines uh, to create breeding habitat for that species. Uh, but right out the gate, you know, when these are produced in 2011, 2013, um, yeah, you've created glossy documents and you continue to, to document the decline of a species and really nothing has happened to reverse the decline of the species. It takes implementing these documents uh, to make a difference uh, from, a, from a forest bird population perspective. All too often, these documents are created and they sit on desks and collect dust and don't have an advocate that, that promote their, their use. So we, um, we built our partnership starting in 2011. Um, again, a welcoming, partnership that had shared visions. In this case, it was um, not just for golden wing warbler, but maybe for other species, maybe game species, also for, for balancing age classes if they were just forest managers interested in, in, in improving the, the conditions of their forests. But there was a shared vision of what or, or end goal in, in mind. And that's when we started the Pennsylvania um, Young Forest Partnership. And and, and I don't know if any of us really necessarily 100% cared about the young forest part of it. It was just an opportunity to start somewhere. And there were funds available to focus on this needed age class, uh, something that was missing. We had the documents, we had the partnership, we needed some more money, um, but we had a goal of, of creating a little bit of this type of, of forest condition that you see on the right. We needed those funds to be able to overcome many of the capacity uh, and, and implementation issues uh, that challenge us. Who's gonna do the work, right? All of us have overloaded plates. 
Um, we need to find folks that who's when, when their phone rings or their email dings, they're able to focus solely on the task at hand and not be distracted. They need funds to be able to implement many of those forest stand improvement activities that are, that are costly. Uh, we need to be able to communicate with different forest ownership domains, public land managers, private forest owners, consulting foresters, and so forth. And then, of course, um, from a young forest perspective, succession happens, and uh, and that means your work is never done when you're trying to keep young forest conditions or structure on the landscape, or at least it's not done in one's one's own career. We are very lucky that uh, NRCS implemented Working Lands for Wildlife in 2012 and included the golden winged warbler as one of its focal species or target species in that effort. And that uh, provided us funds to work with private landowners within our focal areas uh, of, the of the Appalachian Mountains uh, to implement practices that would both uh, improve forest health and eventually create the conditions necessary to support nesting golden winged warblers. And our partnership um, generated resources necessary to, to have a turnkey approach, if you will, to working with private landowners to, to make um, this program uh, a success, a success in implementing uh, thousands of acres over the last several of years uh, through sustainable forest practices. It would involve working, you know, meeting with landowners, talking about their uh, own objectives and, and understanding how their objectives might fit in with our program objectives. A forester going into the field and collecting silvicultural uh, data, uh, assisting landowners with the marking of boundaries, uh, working with loggers and the landowners and, and consulting foresters uh, to make sure that projects were initiated and got off on the right on the right foot and following protocols. And then of course, um, sitting back and, and watching um, forests regenerate and, uh, and create the conditions necessary for golden wing warbler. 15,808 uh, acres in Pennsylvania alone uh, since we initiated the program in 2012. So, oops, I'm sorry. We've also had a monitoring uh, program funded by NRCS and the Game Commission and, um, and National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, whereby we visited um, 459 managed sites on public and private lands across uh, these three states. And we found about a 30% occupancy uh, uh, for golden wing warbler, which we have to remember this species is currently being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Its Appalachian population has plummeted. There's not a golden wing warbler under every leaf to populate uh, uh, a stand uh, that is uh, regenerating. Many of us think that 30% right out the gate is, is, a, is, a, is a pretty um, optimistic value we're excited about. And Dr. McNeely's faculty at University of Kentucky now, um, his, his PhD uh, work focused on examining relationships or factors that have that influenced occupancy across these stands and we found the number of growing seasons to be a positive effect and of course the amount of deciduous forest in the landscape so you need to be patient before you judge too quickly as to whether or not a golden wing warbler is going to occupy the site and we need to be working in in forest landscapes that are dominated by deciduous forest and they really don't like a lot of mixed forest in the landscape try to keep the forest cover at about 70 to 75% or greater. And of that forest cover, only about maximum 10% in the mixed forest age class if you wanna maximize golden wing warbler occupancy. One of the most uh, interesting perhaps and most important things we learned also is that um, population structure across the local landscape is really important. 99% um, of our detections were less than uh, 8.5 miles from a known golden winged warbler location. Uh, that's 99%. So if, you're, if your habitat project, your forest management project was further than 8.5 miles from a known golden winged warbler breeding population, you likely were not going to have a golden winged warbler occupy your site. 
Well, that's challenging when we're thinking about a private lands program, a private lands program that works hard to find every land owner they possibly can over time and space. And sometimes, you know, they, they're they quite distant from each other uh, spatially, like these two examples on the screen. They were done one year after the other, but they're quite far away from each other. And then, of course, in time, maybe 2013 stand is closer to the one that's in, created in 2023. But by the time 2023 is on the ground and is attracting uh, as it has the conditions that are attractive to golden wings, the 2013 is out of golden wing warbler um, conditions uh, or, or what's attractive to golden wing warbler and so on and so forth. So it's difficult to meet uh, some, some threshold of occupancy when we're working across large landscapes that have um, no populations and for which most of the work we do is opportunistic finding those landowners interested in doing this kind of work. Which is really important, uh, it's really important to stress uh, why public lands is, is a critical part of the conservation um, story. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we are quite fortunate to have quite a bit of, private, uh, of public lands scattered across our state. That takes form of state parks, state forests, and state game lands, as well as the Allegheny National Forest. And those places, unlike most of that, you know, the matrix of private lands, um, they form contiguous large forest blocks. They have agency foresters employed that are, of course, helping be stewards and managers of those forests. They have existing management plans, which are important for long-term landscape scale planning. And, and, and they have some, generally have some base uh, annual budget that allows them to implement some of the uh, action items within those plans. Uh, all of that collectively uh, pr provides an opportunity for, for public lands that are strategically located across, let's say, the state or some conservation region to serve as anchor points, if you will, of, uh, of forest bird conservation or forest wildlife conservation. So we can take this map again and think about those private lands projects, uh, but let's think about those in a, in a landscape that does have one of these um, focal public lands uh, that we can manage for the long term uh, to have diverse forest conditions, uh, both, both age class, stand age class conditions, as well as, as other forms in, in which one can get structural complexity on a landscape. And suddenly the, the spatial, uh, you know, if you have populations on this property, um, they reproduce, they colonize, they advance into newly created uh, sites within that block. And of course, those create uh, individuals um, that can colonize uh, the sites that you're creating on nearby private lands. And this is really the concept that we have adopted in the last uh, five, six years now, um, the dynamic forest uh, restoration approach, uh, block approach. Um, we have a problem though we have to fix, and that is that even our public lands, the vast majority of them are quite simple, uh, dominated by that single uh, age class of, of maturing forest, not mature forest, maturing uh, forest. And that again resulted um, from from that landscape scale clearing events of the early 1900s. So we need to find ways uh, to get diversity on our landscape, local diversity on our landscapes, to be able to get the diversity that we desire. And that's expensive. Um, and we're very fortunate that National Fish and Wildlife Foundations and its many partners that contribute funds to its programs uh, have been at work in recognizing um, this challenge and the need for this work to be accomplished. Two programs that our partnership uh, has used heavily in the last six years is the Central Appalachians Habitat Stewardship Program, as well as the Delaware River Watershed Conservation Fund. And I think there is no doubt that these two programs um, have allowed our Young Forest Partnership to evolve into what we call the Dynamic Forest Partnership. And the Dynamic Forest Partnership to date since 2017 
um, again, morphing from that young forest partnership, our dynamic forest partnership, um, seizing the opportunity uh, from these two funding pools and other matching funds to be able to focus on what we call the dynamic forest restoration block approach. Um, so we have some key conservation regions in Pennsylvania that you see in green, areas of dominated by forests that are important to, to forest uh, wildlife as well as uh, other, uh, other just human user groups, um, common uh, very popular recreation areas, for example. Uh, and then the black uh, polygons that you see within them are our dynamic forest blocks that we have created to date. So across these three um, uh, conservation regions, um, the green polygons, we have 319 700 acres belonging to 31 units that are currently uh, categorized as dynamic forest restoration blocks. And you can see our diverse group of partners at the bottom that are, um, that are joining our efforts to, to be able to make this a reality. It starts with a plan. Um, we might take an example here about a 15% young forest, 30 to 5 to 50% mixed age forest, and then a goal of 35 to 50% late serial stage forest on our landscapes within our dynamic forest blocks. Um, that plan uh, identifies, you know, we do the, the full inventory of a site. Uh, the plan identifies where we have opportunities to do work. Um, again, various types of practices will be implemented to achieve those stated um, goals. You can see here in 2020, uh, we have um, and, and we have 0% young, zero to five-year-old forest on this landscape. And in 15 years, the work we do will result in 4.6%. But you can see that we're still missing a lot of these different age classes in our forests. One thing to point out is that 40 to 80 year old bracket in 2020 becomes one to four uh, to, to 1% uh, in 2035, so 15 years later. No, we're not cutting the forest. It's all advancing. It's advancing to the next age class. This diversification of, of our Eastern forest, especially in oak uh, dominated forest or mesophytic forest, we have to be very careful and slow and uh, make sure that the recipe is followed to do things sustainably. But you can still also see that in 2035, we're still at zero uh, year old, zero uh, percent, 125 year old or greater forest. Um, it's going to be a couple 15 year old 15 year cycles before we actually get this age class distribution balanced to the way we desire. Certainly more than a career. We monitor uh, all of our blocks as well for two years as we start the diversification process. So far, we've monitored over 3,090 points twice a year for the first two years of, of a block's existence. We also are using um, uh, autonomous recording units in more recent years to be able to monitor a subset of all of these sites. Um, we're able to create uh, baseline metrics, uh, generate baseline metrics from, uh, from that uh, avian data. We also collect vegetation data at all of these points as well. So golden wing warbler, cerulean warbler, wood thrush, you can see um, those uh, statistics for those focal species, as well as kind of the community uh, metrics within this particular block. Uh, but the lion's share of our focus, of course, is to, to implement, implement management practices that foresters identify as, um, as needs, addressing threats and improving conditions across these forest blocks. We're really, uh, it's kind of a, a, a a oh, cool wow factor. We we're very fortunate in 2019, 2020, we basically had statewide LIDAR flown for us and uh, worked with our partners at um, the University of Maryland uh, and, um, and created a, a data set of 15 forest metrics. And, and we're able to, to look at our forests in ways that really previously um, haven't, haven't been possible. And then this one here is just an example chunk of, of, a, of, a, of a forest patch that can see we have, um, notice the blue here in this young overstory removal with residuals. Compared to this slightly older overstory removal, you can see the shrub, the understory development starting to, to progress here. This is a different niche than this. And this intact, contiguous, tall forest 
is of of course um, part of the landscape recipe. It's the only way the only way you have this in perpetuity, and on your landscape is the only way you're going to be able to continue to create the conditions that you see in this image. Finishing up here with a, uh, a few uh, slides, um, just kind of zooming in on the Poconos uh, landscape. We have 18 blocks, um, some uh, more recently added private land blocks, uh, private groups uh, are becoming very interested in our dynamic forest program. Um, they're excited about how their lands dovetail nicely with public lands and how we can work across boundaries to uh, have this, this landscape uh, scale effect uh, on forest uh, conservation. Um, and, and of course, you know, from a state agency perspective, you know, you can't escape what's happening outside your boundaries does have an influence on what's happening inside your boundaries. So being able to work with local landowners uh, in the landscape is, uh, is very attractive. Knowing that there are folks out there um, desiring to do good work on their private forests and, and finding ways to, to promote that and to reward those landowners for doing, uh, to take, for taking that, the, those uh, proper stewardship um, steps is, is keenly important to us. Uh, if we just zoom in on some of the blocks that have been in the program since the beginning, 2017, 2018, um, the orange areas in those blocks are areas that we've had some kind of uh, implementation uh, completed. And most of those, um, those orange polygons you see there are non-commercial, non non-canopy uh, influencing uh, practices, prescribed fire, invasive species control, uh, fern control, things like that. Some preparatory work, um, but not a whole lot of forest um, uh, timber, um, timber harvesting yet. Uh, rounding out how we get this done um, through a lot of these grants and the matching from our partners. Um, lots of partners that are contributing their funds in a cooperative way, not a competitive way, not submitting multiple grants to do the same kind of work, but saying, hey, let's work together to achieve successes and put our money together to be able to, to work uh, collectively as a group. Um, to, to, to pursue our shared vision. Um, we're also very proud that the vast majority of our, our funds goes to habitat implementation. And then of course, plan writing is an important part and the monitoring component uh, would round out the vast majority of the, of the funds. Administrative funds, quite minimal uh, component of, of our, our grant expenditures. And today, um, about 38,570 acres with thousands of more um, planned and to be completed in 2023 and beyond. And those come from private lands uh, project uh, programs like Working Lands for Wildlife, the RCPP uh, program for cerulean warblers in Pennsylvania, as well as our dynamic forest partnership uh, the, within the, the dynamic forest restoration blocks. Um, through this partnership, we're, we're seeing the success, we're monitoring uh, species response to be able to work in an adaptive management framework to tweak things. Uh, and we're also uh, advancing our approach. Uh, our more recent grant uh, has provided funds for us to be able to work with landowners that are in Pennsylvania Game Commission's um, uh, hunter access program. So bringing opportunities to do uh, work on those lands uh, to improve forest conditions uh, is something we look forward to do uh, to doing over the next couple of years. And my final slide is, um, you know, I remain hopeful. Um, habitat projects uh, or or habitat based initiatives to recover species have a reputation, have a history of being successful if given enough time uh, and resources um, for uh, wa waterfall populations. Um, really, kind of uh, conservation picked up. Steam in the mid 80s with wetland, with a focus on wetland preservation and restoration. And we saw subsequently waterfowl populations respond. 
saw the great, you know, in your neck of the woods, we saw what happens when uh, there's a sustained focus on, on management for the Kirtland's warbler. And we can always think about how fortunate we are that someone didn't right here um, decide that this was a fail and uh, and 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 not uh, and not continue conservation efforts. We know the results, of course, uh, quite well uh, regarding Kirtland's warbler and its delisting. Uh, I'm hopeful that eastern forest birds can have that same success. It's gonna it's gonna take time, and I don't know what that trend line looks like, um, but I. But I think that with the diverse partnerships, like the example I provided here today, uh, in, in the resources that comes with those uh, collaborations, we should, we should be able to, to make a, a serious go of it. I uh, appreciate your attention. It's always great to, to be able to talk to the practitioners and, uh, and thank the practitioners for the work they do and encourage you to, to keep doing the work you do, uh, knowing that you do that work often, uh, at least partially in a shadow of, of critics uh, that are passionate about what they think, uh, but, but may, may, not be, um, may not be most informed in, in, in the trenches every day and understanding the challenges that we face. So thanks for, for your efforts, uh, for sure. And I'll take any questions that folks might have. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. That that was great. And and as questions are coming in, um, I just real quick wanted to plug our uh, flagship event, the research and practice review. It's tomorrow. Um, registration is still open if, if folks would like to uh, join. And there's a um, link there in the chat. And so our first question uh, <clears throat> was: Is there any move to reintroduce wolves into uh, Pennsylvania wolves? That is to deal with the deer overpopulation? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. And, um, and I would say that, you know, just as a, I would say just as a, as a person who's lives in the rural landscape of Pennsylvania, um, I would say that the, the social tolerance at this point would, would be, um, probably not there. Mm -hmm. If I think about my neighbors, doesn't matter what I think. <laughs> we also, um, you know, we also have to, we also have this, it's, it's, it's quite, you know, it's quite this, this, this balancing act, right, of hunter pressure for more deer and, and forest managers realizing the threats that more deer have on, on our landscapes. And earlier, you mentioned the need for communication with and between a variety of stakeholders. Are there any communication strategies that you found particularly effective um, so far? And I'll just I'll do that first part first. Yeah. Um, I would say the community the communication strategies certainly differ between the private lands work that we do. So I have um, <clears throat> I have uh, three private lands foresters currently, and I've had them in place since 2012. They work directly with Working Lands for Wildlife and NRCS field offices. And um, we, you know, our approach with private forest owners is is much different than, of course, our approach with, with, with public land managers. Um, we, you know, there, there's a language that you speak and there's a certain, and there's a certain, um, a, a certain level of initial conversation that may not have anything to do with forests, right? It's just kind of like building a trust factor and in in really kind of understanding the landowner's objectives and um, their values. That takes that takes time, and that's you know, and you have to be careful because. Like one day I'll work with public landowners and the other day I'll work with private landowners and same with some of my foresters, we kind of move back and forth and you have to really get yourself into the mindset of like, we're not meeting with forester John uh, for the state forest tomorrow We're we're meeting with someone who doesn't have the same base foundation, right? So we have to really kind of take a step back. Um, I don't, well, I don't like to use words like 
early successional forest. Uh, when I work with a private landowner, we like to say young forest, or we like to say forest stewardship. You know, I, I find myself going back and forth between management kind of words and stewardship kind of words, but we're doing the same practices. We're trying to achieve the same thing. It's just, it's just different language. So um, sometimes we'll do some outreach mailings um, and we'll plan some outreach events for private landowners, uh, as well as agency foresters, kind of like training events. Um, but uh, it's, I would say just as much as we promote having foresters be able to use all the tools in their toolbox, I think it's really important to allow the communicators to use all the communication tools that they have in their toolbox. I'm excited about building a storyboard uh, currently, which it's under construction regarding our dynamic forest block work. I'll have to stay tuned for that. Um, are climate change driven disturbances having a significant impact on forest complexity? Um, that's a that's a tricky one. Uh, I would say that that they almost certainly probably are, but the degree to which they're noticeable, like right now uh is probably just in its you know just in its infancy um one one can think about um what will happen with um wildfire severity as well as um what kind of forest pests and what and, and other diseases uh that will come uh in either increased increased frequency or novelty uh as as our climates change uh in our eastern forests and what impacts that will have, uh, but but I I don't think it's you know I, I think it would be foolish to think that those climate generated dist uh, disturbances uh, aren't aren't working at present and certainly will not increase uh, over the next several decades. And kind of going back to your your storyboard uh, that you mentioned. Um, can you go back over the dynamic block age class planning approach? I'm not sure I understand the block scheduling and layout procedure within a dynamic landscape unit. Is there a good resource to go over that in depth? Um, well, we uh, we talk first with uh, just like a private landowner on these public blocks. We talk about what the objectives are, right? Uh, all of these lands have objectives. And, and again, we have state parks where we would use a more ecological forestry approach uh, akin to all of the great work that Tony D'Amato and, and his colleagues have been, have been um, uh, promoting. Um, and then we have our Pennsylvania game lands, right? Our state wildlife uh, agency lands. It's about 1.5 million acres for which a lot of our dynamic forest blocks are, are based. And then of course we have our state forests. All of those public landowners, uh, public land managers have slightly the same, but slightly different um, objectives and goals. So we first start with understanding what their age class distribution goals or what their structural goals might look like. And then we go to work thinking uh, through our through our forest planning, um, uh, identifying areas, I guess we would call them um, assets and liabilities, if you will. What assets do we have in our forests, and where are and where are the liabilities? Uh, where are they spatially, uh, and and what are their, you know, if left unchecked um, temporally, what's going to be uh, an outcome across this across this forest block? And when we collect forest measurement, um, forest metrics uh, ac across varying uh, locations in the forest. And identify those assets and those um, and those liabilities, and then we plan accordingly. Um, thinking again about some of the avian and other wildlife conservation um, goals and objectives, and thinking about proximity, thinking about um, the amount of mature forest we want to continue to um, exist and and continue to mature. And, and how corridors and such might look. Uh, it's it's every, every block has its own uh, kind of flavor in, in planning, if you will. But we really try to hold true to those age, those uh, general age class distributions. I think we'll try to squeeze in one more question here and then we'll call it, I do see it's um, rolling up on 10 here. Um, 
Great presentation. What you presented as part of the solution in forest management. How are your wood markets uh, for having an outlet for your wood products? That's one of the biggest challenges um, from this. Yes. Um, it is our biggest challenge. Uh, and we um, we we struggle we struggle with that uh, we struggle with uh, you know in in our eastern forests so much of the you know if we're going to regenerate a forest so much of the the, the process of of getting a stand to the point where we can more confidently regenerate it feeling like we're going to get the outcome we desire requires a lot of that low grade wood being removed in some way shape or form and if we're not removing it commercially then we're removing it via paying someone to do it and uh and and that is and will continue to be a challenge for us we we largely folk we largely recognize that that is one of our biggest challenges right now and, and there's a, a core group of us that are working on trying to advance um some wood market um, revitalization, if you will. Uh, we're fortunate that we do have um, one company like Domtar in uh, the northeast or north central part of Pennsylvania, and they're a great partner with us. Um, we try to we try to um, to work with them as much as we can uh, to, you know, there's there's definitely a win win situation there. Uh, especially in our efforts to fix high graded forests, forests for which they forests for which there's not not even a market for any saw timber, you know, off those lands, and you know, a, a, a logger of, or or someone you know approaches them to to do work, and they you know they walk onto the stand and they go, oh yeah, there's really nothing here, and they leave, um, and that's difficult for us when we're trying to um, maybe reset reset those forests and make those forests a little bit better. Wood markets is huge. It is, it is um, revitalizing wood markets as well as getting private landowners to understand the detrimental effects of high grading is by far the two most pressing conservation forest, uh, forest conservation issues we have in the East. I have no doubt about that. And they're driven, they're, they're both driven, right? There's a saw log market. So, you can get someone to come and take your saw logs and leave all your junk. There's no doubt if landowners had an opportunity in a market to, to offload those low grade, that low grade volume that would, they would be a more easier part of the practice uh, uh, of, the, of the plan. Sure. Well, thank you all for uh, attending and thank you so much, Jeff, for uh, taking the time to uh, deliver this presentation. Um, we are a little bit past the hour here, but if there's any other, I know we didn't get to all the questions. If you all would like to reach out, um, I encourage you all to reach out over email. The email is um, on the screen, but thank you all. And thanks again, Jeff. Appreciate it. Very welcome. Thanks for uh, listening.